code here. Share screen. Right over here. All right. Welcome, everybody, uh, to our next performance school. This is our sixth uh, meetup of the the semester, our first semester doing this. I'd like to welcome everybody that's been with us. Can't thank you guys enough. I feel like many of you guys have been with us every single time, and, and that means so much to us because we really want to make this a you know community, but, but kind of like a little family environment where we can jam together over lunchtime. But also I'd like to welcome people that may be here the first time. I see some people across campus from academics. Welcome uh, to you guys for being here. It definitely means a lot. There's a lot of cool things happening here at Penn State, and we want this to be one of those things. So today, um, we're, we're lucky, we're fortunate to have um, our, our own John Fleury. He's the Director of Applied Health and Performance Science here for us. And, um, you know, his biggest role on staff is he manages basically all of our operations as it, as it pertains to um, data organization from testing to systems operations. He's the mastermind behind everything. And uh, we go way back to our time um, in, in the state of Texas. And John has a really big background um, at several universities around the country and, and in the NFL with the Jacksonville Jaguars. So he's really well versed in what he's gonna be talking about today and hamstring injury um, prevention um, and uh, looking forward to this. But before we start today, just want to do a couple housekeeping things. And one of those is just every single time we talk on here, I want to make it an effort to um, encourage planning from a, a wide, uh, like a, a large scale plan, a long term plan, all the way to a day to day planning. You know, when we plan and we put things on paper, and include different people within the performance group that's there every day. Um, it, it really helps everything. So planning, communications, and then as we depart and go home for the period of time over Christmas, just outreach with your athletes, with different staff members, the more we can communicate and be transparent on paper, and I say paper loosely, on computer, when we plan on, the, on however we do, make sure that that's communicated and no surprise rule. You know, we've been really fortunate this semester to have a lot of neat things um, on this performance school. We've, like I mentioned, had six um, meetups, this being the sixth. And we've talked about everything from uh, coaching language to uh, providing feedback. We've had different departments speak. You know, Jake Stone spoke on player development within our baseball program here. We had the sports analytics group with Samir and Mallet pop on. We've had Nick from performance nutrition. We've had members of performance science talk about cold weather exposure, travel. We've had guests from outside within elite sport. And more importantly, we've had conversations um, amongst all of us. And that's that's the, the key to what we're trying to do here. If you remember one of the first ones we had, we introduced the idea behind a learning community and the whole idea of a, a community of practice. A community of practice is just a group of learners um, that's you know, they share a, a mission, a vision, a common direction, but it may be of different areas of expertise. Within our case, we're different sports, different departments, but we all have areas that we can contribute. So this is what we want to use as the foundation. Um, doesn't mean we have to keep it the same. Always welcome to, to some feedback and advice on how we can grow this and make this better. Um, but um, definitely excited about the direction we're heading and we think we can continue to make this better. As a reminder, we put all these on YouTube. Um, these are really easily um, accessed. We can just search these. We also send these out as links in the monthly newsletter that we'll send out from the Performance Science Department, but these are easily linked. Um, and I'll also mention that if anytime there's ever something said that's sensitive that someone doesn't want shared at any time, please let us know and we'll make sure that we make that private or buff it out of the actual presentation. Um, so with that, I'm going to pass it over to John Flurry. I will uh, stop my share here. You have access to this, but uh, again, appreciate everybody being here today. Please um, be active in conversations. If there's questions at any time, this is informal. Um, thank you guys, and John, you got it, brother. Appreciate it, Josh. 
Um, hey everyone, thanks for uh, stopping in today to hear me talk a little bit about, about this topic. Over the last couple months, um, we as a staff have kind of been doing a little bit of a dive into some of the current um, and recent hamstring research. Um, and we put together a couple, couple different reviews and we sent that out to the sports performance team members here, um, our strength staff, athletic training. We also sent it out to sports psych and nutrition so that way they have the information as well. So what we wanted to do um, was just quickly kind of summarize some of the stuff that we sent out um, in these reviews. Um, we'll, we'll talk about the research behind hamstring injury prevention and then also some of the practicality, um, right? Because in elite level sport, whenever you're, uh, you're trying to develop athletes and peak performance, right? It takes a combination of both um, evidence-based practice as well as some, uh, some coach's eye and anecdotal evidence as well. Um, so we'll go ahead and we'll move into some of the stuff that we found. Um, first of all, why, why is this topic important? Why should we care um, about hamstring injuries in athletes? Um, first off, uh, they are the most commonly injured uh, or type of muscle strain uh, in, in athletes. Um, recently, um, there was a study that, that um, used some of the NCAA injury surveillance data, um, which looked at 25 different NCAA sports um, over about five years or so. Um, and they gained a bunch of different information regarding uh, hamstring strain injuries. Um, one of those things being that there has been a total of, over this time frame, um, a total of 1,142 hamstring injuries in the NCAA, which is, which is a big number. Um, of those injuries, 12.6% were classified as being recurrent. So not an original hamstring injury, but a second, third, or, or potentially fourth hamstring injury. So um, it's not something that's you know, one and done. It has, it has potential for it to uh, pop up later down the road. And then the last thing being um, of these, uh, all these hamstring injuries, 72.3% um, were classified as non-contact, right? So um, this kind of gives us a, a little bit of insight into how we could potentially manage um, the risk behind uh, hamstring injuries um, based on us knowing that a lot of them are non-contact and we can potentially do something about it. Right, so how, how do hamstring injuries occur, right? Typically, hamstring injuries occur most frequently during high-speed running or sprinting activities, right? And that's not all of them, but a majority of them do. So um, some of our sports that require our athletes to sprint fast and sprint frequently, um, but this is where we're going to see a majority of these injuries, right? And then it comes down to, um, it's been hypothesized um, that, this typically occurs during the late swing phase of our sprint gait, right? As you can see here with Usain Bolt sprinting here on the track, um, this late swing phase or the terminal swing phase is right before touchdown, right? So the hamstring experiences, um, it e eccentrically lengthens to decelerate the knee during this phase. Uh, muscle activation can be upwards of 100%. Um, and the actual length of the hamstring muscles um, actually uh, increased to almost 112% of, uh, of normal standing hamstring length. Um, so um, during this phase of the sprint, they're experiencing high lengths and high forces, um, which potentially can put it at, at risk um, during sprinting. In terms of risk factors, so we know that the hamstrings experience a lot of stress during sprint during sprinting. Um, so what are some risk factors that could potentially be associated with, with hamstrings being injured during sprints? Um, there's a lot of different things, a lot of factors that can go into or lead into potential hamstring injuries, right? Some of them are uh, classified as non-modifiable, right? Which is something we cannot directly impact. Um, and then others, we can. Right, we can influence through training, through practice, through education, through rehab. So these are the big, the big pieces that um, we wanna focus on whenever we're trying to develop a program that it's aimed at trying to prevent some of these injuries. So how do we prevent hamstring injuries? We know that they go under extreme amount of stress during sprinting activities. 
there's a ton of different risk factors associated with them, right? Um, but we have to know that they're complex. It's a complex and multifactorial problem. So that means it requires a multi-component holistic solution, right? Es essentially what that means is there's no magic bullet, right? There's no one thing that's gonna help prevent hamstring issues. Um, there is, there's, uh, it has to be holistic and a lot of different components have to be involved and worked on together collectively as a unit. Um, and that comes from our strength coaches, our athletic training staff, nutrition, even our sport coaches all have a role in managing these injuries, right? But for today, we're gonna focus on um, three big puzzle pieces, right? So there's tons of pieces to this puzzle, but there are three big pieces we're gonna focus on today. The first one being eccentric hamstring strength. The second being high speed sprint exposure. And then the third, is lumbopelvic control. And we'll dive deep into uh, all three of these, starting with uh, eccentric hamstring strength. Um, through some research, um, what has been found is that strong and long hamstrings um, potentially um, are protective against hamstring injuries. What that means is that uh, ham hamstrings that are, are knee flexors that are eccentrically strong um, and then their fascicle lengths, biceps femoris are long, right? So weak eccentric knee flexors and short biceps femoris increase the risk of hamstring injury. Um, this has also been backed up in previous studies that showed athletes who suffered a previous hamstring injury, or injury um, had shorter biceps femoris fascicle lengths and were weaker on the injured side compared to the non-injured side. Um, and eccentric hamstring training has been shown to improve eccentric strength as well as, as, well as increase biceps femoris uh, fascicle length. And a lot of this research has been done around uh, the Nordic hamstring exercise, which is uh, pretty popular. And I know a lot of our strength coaches across campus utilize this in, our, in their programming. Um, so just based on some of what uh, some of the science says, Performing the Nordic hamstring exercise resulted in increased uh, biceps femoris fascicle length, like, like we just discussed. Um, it has also been shown to half, so around 51%, the rate of hamstring injuries in athletic populations. Um, and this has been shown not only um, in uh, specific uh, athlete groups, right, but it's been shown across a bunch of different sports. So we've seen it in baseball, track and field, rugby, soccer, a lot of athletes and a lot of different sport groups have been um, subject to some of these um, uh, experiments in terms of uh, trying to identify the impact of the Nordic hamstring exercise on hamstring injury. Um, and then we also know that low volume is just as effective as, as high volume. Um, there's, there was one study that, uh, that compared the two to see if um, what the impact were on the architectural changes to the hamstrings, um, comparing the high volume to low volume program. Uh, and, and the sets and reps shown here uh, were from the low volume program. So once a week, two to four reps, uh, two, two sets of about four reps should uh, suffice in terms of um, getting some of those positive architectural changes to, to the hamstrings, um, which, which could increase compliance as well and effort, right? Because uh, eccentric training, especially our Nordic hamstring exercises are gonna to lead to high levels of, of soreness and discomfort. Um, so we've, if we can get the same benefit out of it with low volume and manage, and manage that soreness and manage that discomfort, then it's a win-win situation. Now, some other considerations to, to think about whenever we're prescribing um, the Nordic hamstring exercise in terms of timing before or after training, I think uh, there has been some research on this as well. Um, and it's shown that you still get the benefits of our positive architectural changes to the hamstring muscle, whether you do it before or after training. But I think uh, caution should be taken into effect in terms of what type of training session are you doing, right? So if you are doing a sprint session, right, where we're running at high speeds and we're trying to improve, um, improve speed, then doing it after may be better, right? Because we don't want to go into that sprint session with with fatigued or damaged hamstrings from our Nordic hamstring exercise, or the same goes for practice as well. Um, if, if 
you train in the morning and there's a big period of time between practice, you may have a little bit of wiggle room there, but sometimes depending on what you're doing out on the field, it may be benef more beneficial to do it, do it after. So that way um, it does not impede with what you're trying to get done on the field. Um, in terms of other types of variations, um, it's important to regress and progress dependent on the athlete that you're prescribing this exercise for. Um, if you have an athlete that is weak, um, they may have difficulty controlling their, their body down on the lowering phase of uh, the Nordic hamstring exercise. So adding some additional band assistance may be a way to help them progress and uh, improve and get uh, stronger throughout the training plan. Um, some other options are uh, extenuated eccentrics. So that would be for a stronger athlete who on the lowering phase, they can hold on to an additional weight and an additional dumbbell to add some extra overload. And then they would let go of the dumbbell at, at the bottom portion, need to push themselves back up or, or if you feel like they are advanced enough, they can pull themselves back up with their hamstrings. Um, and then potentially another option would be a dumbbell offset um, Nordic hamstring exercise, which would be holding a dumbbell on one side to provide um, a, uh, an overload to the, uh, uh, the opposite hamstring muscle. So if you have an individual who may have a weak left hamstring compared to the right, you would put the dumbbell in their right hamstring to try to target that left side. Um, and then some other considerations would be, even though the Nordic hamstring has been shown to impact um, and reduce the, the risk of injury in athletes, right? You still need to have a holistic program, right? So RDLs, deadlifts, isometrics, split squats, um, they're all very important pieces to a, uh, a holistic hamstring injury prevention program. So training the hamstring at multiple angles and velocities will help you cover all your bases there. And then unilateral versus bilateral, um, it, it's, it's important as well not to just focus bilaterally all the time, um, trying to uh, target an individual leg, like we mentioned with the dumbbell offset, may be beneficial for an athlete that may um, show some kind of imbalance or have a previously injured hamstring on one side as well. And then an important note here, um, this was observed in a couple of the different studies that we explored. The hamstring architectural adaptations reverse following a 28-day detraining period. So you can go six to 10 week program in person on campus, train the hamstrings to make them robust, um, make them stronger, make them longer. But when, if they go away from here and they experience detraining like we did during the lockdown, I know a lot of us have athletes at home right now for an extended period of time. Um, if, if there's not some kind of hamstring training involved in their programming, then, um, then they may uh, see a um, reversal of some of the adaptations that they got when they were here. And then if, if we think this is something that's important, which research shows it does, um, that it is, um, then we can also measure hamstring strength with, with the use of some of our technology on campus. So we have uh, the Nord board, which I know a lot of our, our teams use um, here. So if, if you ever need one, just you, you can contact us and, and check one out to use and test our athletes with. All right, now moving on to sprint exposure. We've got a good picture of Saquon running his 40 right here a couple of years ago. Um, but there was a study that was done that wanted to compare the, imp or the, uh, the hamstring activity level of various hamstring exercises against sprinting. And what they showed was that there, are, there is no other exercise that activates the hamstrings to the same level um, that sprinting does. Um, so even the Nordic hamstring exercise which we deem to be an important part of uh, hamstring strengthening does not activate the hamstrings to the same level as just running fast. Um, there was another study that wanted to actually look at, okay, so we know that activity level of the hamstrings is highest in sprinting, um, even higher than Nordics. What if we programmed a sprint or speed-based program and compared that to a Nordic hamstring exercise program to identify um, the uh, architectural adaptations to the hamstrings and, and how it impacts those. Um, so what these researchers found were that um, there was a moderately superior um, adaptations when uh, 
in the, in the athletes that performed a sprint based program compared to um, a Nordic hamstring exercise only group. Um, so not only, um, not only is there a reduced risk of injury that comes along with programming sprints, but there's also going to be an increase in performance, um, which was not seen in, in any of the other groups. Um, so you're reducing the risk of hamstring injury, and you're also improving speed and power performance. Um, these research researchers also suggested, um, based on the program that they implemented in, in this uh, study, was that uh, a wide variety of force and velocity conditions be prescribed. Um, and what I what we mean by that is having different sprint exercises that may be high force and low velocity, moderate force, moderate velocity, and also uh, high velocity and, and, and low force as well. Um, so we have our little guy up there. Um, I know it's been referenced a couple of times in different in different research and in different uh, media on surfing the force velocity curve. Um, and here we're just going to show some examples of some different exercises that we can implement in a um, a well-rounded sprint-based program. Um, so if we're talking about high force, we're looking at heavy resisted sprints. Um, so this would be be sled towing or, or prowler sprints. And then we also have light resisted sprints or hill sprints. Um, with the heavy resisted sprints, those are going to typically be over shorter distances. The light resisted sprints can, can uh, stretch out a little longer. Um, we have bounds and skips. And as we're working down to a higher velocity, we have our, our free sprints. And then at the very end, our highest velocity conditions are going to be any of our fly-in sprints or any uh, assisted sprints or um, overspeed downhill running. Um, there's been a lot of uh, interesting research too in looking at the potential as of sprinting as a, a vaccine against hamstring injury. Um, and what, um, what has been discovered um, specifically uh, in, in this paper is that um, regular sprint exposures over 95% of an individual's max velocity may provide a protective effect against hamstring injuries. Um, and I, I do want to clarify that there's a difference between uh, maximal velocity and maximal effort, right? Like an athlete can run at 100% as hard as they can, but if the conditions around the drill, right, do not allow them to go full speed, um, then they then they are not hitting maximal velocity. Um, so, for for instance, um, maximal velocity re requires space, so open spaces, long distances, um, relatively. Right to sprinting, right? Not not as in um, aerobic running. Um, short rest periods, um, not many obstacles in the way, just so that way we can facilitate in some of those top top end speeds. Um, and a good starting spot is is trying to get over ninety percent of a maximal velocity exposure weekly. If if ninety five, if you do not feel comfortable getting ninety five right away. Um, these research researchers also found that athletes that progressively developed tolerance to higher workloads were able to handle a larger number of sprint exposures, right? So um, they, they kind of uh, um, suggested that around six to 10 uh, maximal velocity exposures um, provided the most protective effect, but they also reiterated, but that this was in the most fit individuals, the ones that were able to tolerate workload the most. Um, so if you have uh, if you have athletes that you bring in uh, and you do uh, you spike or ramp up their workload very rapidly, which we'll talk about in a second, they may not be able to handle a high number of max velocity exposures right off the bat. Right, and just like we talked about, have a progressive plan. So avoid prescribing too much sprinting too soon. Right, so high sprint volumes, depending on your sport and what they're required to do in, in practice and in competition, can have a protective effect as long as they're achieved progressively, as long as you ramp up, ramp up to it, because um, this allows their body to adapt to the stress that they're experiencing um, through through sprinting. And then also remember that high volumes may negatively impact speed capabilities. So just within your plan, identify what your primary goals of that training block is. 
if it's to prepare them for the demand of their sport um, and you want to progressively increase volume, understand that uh, there may be some uh, decreases in overall speed capacity. If you're attempting to improve speed and power, um, then, then, then volume may not mesh well with um, that goal. Right, and this is something that we talked about with the Nord board testing, recording um, and testing and assessing the hamstring strength. The same goes with, uh, with sprint training as well. Right, so if you have, if you're a sport that has catapult GPS, um, you can you can get some max velocities from some of the data there. If you don't, you can use timing gate, stopwatch, find find a drill or an exercise that allows the athletes to run fast and time it. Right, um, we got this from uh, a, a high school track coach from Illinois, Tony Holler, um, who who has a lot of information about record, rank, and, and publish. So testing the athletes, showing them and showing them visually on a leaderboard where they sit and where they stand. So if you're trying to encourage max velocity or high speed running, adding that competitive element can help assist you in getting that done on a weekly basis. As you can see on our, on our little gif right here with Michael Scott um, out, this is from the office if, if you're not an office fan. Um, they had the, the speedometer out there, the radar gun and um, Michael wanted to, to compete with everybody, so he waited until a car was driving by, so that way he can put up the, the best score here on, on the speedometer. And then the last thing we're going to move into is lumbopelvic control. There is not as much uh, research on this. This stuff is, is fairly new um, in terms of investigative research um, when compared to something like the Nordic hamstring exercise or eccentric strength, but there are still some interesting concepts here. Um, what this research group found was that deviating running or sprint mechanics can potentially increase the risk of hamstring injuries, specifically um, anterior pelvic tilt observed during sprinting um, or side to side um, lack of lumbopelvic control when sprinting as well may increase the risk of, of hamstring injury when running. Um, typically, um, if we're looking at someone who exhibits anterior pelvic tilt, we'll see an extra lengthening or stretch position of the hamstring, right? We already talked about during, during sprinting that the hamstrings experience long muscle lengths um, at high forces. So if, if an athlete uh, exhibits um, anterior tilt, they may put the hamstring in an even more at-risk position through um, even greater hamstring lengths. And there is an even more recent study that just came out this year, which was which is pretty exciting, um, was that uh, these researchers found that a multi-component training program can actually lead to a reduction in dynamic anterior pelvic tilt. Um, so what they did was um, they just implemented a six-week training program um, that involved all of the components over to your right here. So manual therapy, mobility, soft tissue work, glute max strengthening, hamstring strengthening, and then a couple of lumbo pelvic specific exercises. Um, and they found that, that this program positively influenced uh, athletes who um, demonstrated anterior pel pelvic tilt throughout the gait cycle. Um, and we have a couple exercises here uh, that they use because there are some supplemental materials and video showing some of the exercises um, that they uh, used within that study. And we can share all this stuff as well. And then in addition to that, which was not covered within the study, but, but that we recommend is even when you're doing some of uh, the lumbopelvic training, it's always good to try to, uh, to implement some of that stuff on the field in a more dynamic nature. Right, so taking what you're doing in the weight room, in the training room, and then taking it out onto the field or taking it out onto the track. This isn't a video, it's just a still screenshot. Um, but then implementing some exercises that try to re reinforce posture in a neutral pelvis position um, when they're doing something more dynamic or fast paced to try to cement those movement patterns in. Um, so for example, this athlete here has a dowel overhead, has a tel the pelvis tucked. Um, you can do a couple different things out of this position like uh, a skips, you can do uh, sprinting accelerations, a couple of different things with, with a dowel overhead or out in front 
um, just to kind of reinforce that pelvis position. And then just to kind of wrap up here, um, so that way I'm not dragging on, I did want to touch on this. Um, what about stretching, foam rolling, hydration, and sleep, right? Because we talked about those three big puzzle pieces, but we did not talk about these things. Uh, all of these are very important in our ground level. Um, they should be stressed every day in terms of um, having positive habits, um, recovery habits, stretching, foam rolling, hydration, sleep, all nutrition, everything, um, everything adds up and can have an impact on performance and injury prevention. But there is no strong evidence that any of these things directly impact hamstring injury prevention, right? So if an athlete is not very mobile, right? Um, or let me, let me say the opposite. If an athlete has weak hamstrings, but they are mobile, um, more stretching is not gonna solve that problem. At that point, they, you need to make sure that you're focusing on hamstring strengthening. Um, the re, there's research behind it. You identified that as a weakness and more stretching or foam rolling or mobility work is not going to solve that problem. It's always important to have a mobile athlete, to have an athlete that's well fueled and well hydrated, um, but we need to make sure we cover those big puzzle pieces um, whenever we're trying to implement a program that it focuses on hamstring injury prevention. Um, and that's all I had. I hope I didn't drag on there. Um, and I'm definitely open to, to any questions. Does anybody have any questions right off the bat? Because I have, I have a couple, but I'll open it to anybody else. Hey, John. What's up, KJ? Can you hear me, man? Yep. Hey, brother. Um, sorry, I'm out walking the dogs and it's freezing <laughs> cold, but I did have a question on your, um, I, I do a lot of resisted running with soccer. Mm -hmm. um, so we always do like band pulls and then chain pulls out on the field. Did you, do you have any research or number uh, around like the, the resistance maybe per body weight uh, that that should be, you know, like do you want, you obviously don't want to go too heavy um, or too light. Now, is there anything that you've come across that, um, that that might be beneficial for the athlete? Yep, yep. I, I can I can send you some stuff. Um, I don't I don't know numbers off the top of my head, but I know there's a couple different papers uh, looking at resistance sled sprints, and and I know um, Tuck too. You can chime in in terms of um, optimally loading loading sprints. Um, but there has been a good amount of recent research on heavy loaded sprints and the impact it has on horizontal force production. Um, so there are benefits in loading sprints heavy and also relatively light in terms of com compared to body weight, right? Like I think I've seen general recommendations um, way back on not trying to exceed over 30% of, of body weight. I think it determines on like, or it depends on what the goal is um, and what part of the sprint you're trying to improve, right? If it's horizontal acceleration and you have an athlete maybe that needs to improve on that area, then, and they don't have great horizontal force production then loading it heavier um, may provide some benefits. Like I, I've seen um, a paper look at almost 80 to not, almost 100% of body weight doing sled towing for five to 10 yards um, and, it, and it improving um, horizontal force production and then also speed and velocity over uh, 10 to 20 yards, so. Awesome, thanks brother. Yep. Hey, let's say we've been talking about planning a lot, Flurry. Um, let's say I'm a coach, let's say I'm a performance coach or, or someone that's working with some new athletes coming in. We're getting ready to have some mid-year enrollees. Let's say they're coming from a high school program. I'm really unsure what they've done. Um, what is the first thing that I would do to ensure um, that I'm not going to overload them too much? Like, What does the first six weeks of their, their program look like in your mind? Um, it could be from a testing and a training perspective. Right. Um, I think it, 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 obviously you have to look at how much, 
I know you mentioned six weeks or whatever it is, right? You have to identify how much time you have first, right? Um, and we always recommend working backwards. And this is regardless, I think, of, of training age or, or time spent in the program, right? You have to identify where they need to go first before you can even take that, that first step. Um, so identify what that first week of training is like needs to look like for you to have a, um, a successful preseason, a successful season, um, and then work backwards from there and find how you can incrementally um, work your athletes up to that point. Um, so for a freshman athlete specifically, I'd imagine you'd want to do a ton of, of different um, assessments across the board, whether that's, uh, I know medical is pretty standard, um, but if we're looking at hamstrings specifically, uh, looking at eccentric hamstring strength with the Nord board, you do uh, force velocity profiling, um, using some of our other technologies, whether that's force plate, um, you can assess a bunch of different things. So that way you can kind of guide and direct training towards what you determine where they need to be a little better. Um, I, hope that, I hope that makes sense and that answered your question, but have, have, have an end in mind where they need to be, find out where they are, so that way you can direct their training um, appropriately. Okay, I have a, a question. Um, so as far as being able to reduce injury in the hamstring, does it, does the type of shoe or surface that you run on matter? So like for us, we train and sprint in tennis shoes in Haluba, but then go put on metal cleats and go run and sprint mostly on dirt. So does that ever affect anything or should we be trained like sprint training more so on the dirt and our cleats or does it have zero effect or do you even have an answer? Right, no, that's, that's a great question. It's something we can, we can look into. I did not come across anything specifically um, that looked into footwear or, or surface. That doesn't mean there isn't any, that just means I didn't um, stumble across any or, or find any. Um, but we can, we can try to get that answer for sure. Thanks. I have a chime in on that for a bit. So, you know, we're using trainers, flats, and most of our training as well as spikes in our training. And we do have quite a bit of athletes, like our distance runners don't run in spikes most of the, in, in training at all. They pretty much just do it for competition, but we do have athletes who sprint um, because of their recovery, I, I, I don't sprint them in spikes as often because um, when we're working on running mechanics for us in terms of sprinting, um, a lot of uh, what we've talked about here, I go back to proper running mechanics. And so if the mechanics are good, if they're getting stronger in the weight room, they're gonna run faster, period. Uh, whether I'm towing them, whether they're towing something else. And so um, once, we have an athlete who has, um, you know, their hamstrings or their muscles take longer to recover. I probably won't sprint them in spikes as much. And so being that you are, you guys are on dirt and you're using um, spikes, um, obviously you use that to dig in and, and get traction when you're running and um, hitting or whatever. Uh, same way we use that for traction when we're running. Um, we don't do it as much with those athletes. And so th there is a difference um, in terms of training. So we'll do a lot of training in trainers and, and flats rather than using spikes because the bad mechanics, if you're extending your foot out in front and pulling back and using your hamstring and you have that spike in the ground and pulling you more, it, it's like you're doing hamstring curls every step you take down a track. And so um, with trainers on, it doesn't have that same effect um, you know, they may slip and fall and then I'll laugh at them and say, well, stand up tall and keep your hip, your feet under your hips. Um, you know, whereas in spikes, they'll get that pull and they'll get all the way through. And, you know, um, a couple of minutes later, it's like, yeah, I felt something in my hamstring on that last acceleration I did, you know, and then they'll look at the video and see that they had a huge extension in um, one of their strides. And that's why they felt that. Thank you. Yeah, appreciate any, that. Uh, do you have any exercises or drills that you like um, to reinforce like a neutral pelvis? Pel yeah, um, high knees. Um, so we, we do high knees a lot. Um, 
and every that's everyone's favorite drill. I teach it a little bit different. Um, I tell them because everyone's been doing high knees since they first started doing any particular sport in their life. And um, but a lot of times people are taught high knees wrong. Um, they're taught to get your knees up. And at the point of getting your knees up, if your hips drop, a coach is like, yeah, your knees are high. And it's like, no, start with your hips up. Let's work to keep your hips up. Let's work to keep your hips stable and bring your toes to your knees, your knees to your hips, but never drop your hips. And so if someone's knees and I tell them and I demonstrate myself, you know, and I'm, I'm like, look, do my knees look as high as you guys think they should? And he was like, well, no. And I'm like, well, I, this is as high as I feel like my knees should go um, without my hips dropping. And you'll work up into having, you know, this Carl Lewis type of high knee, you know, but right now you might have this Michael Johnson type high knee and, you know, who ran faster in the 200. So, um, you know, I, high knees is something that I really work on, um, working on that core, keeping the core up. Um, I also have this drill that I call is, um, I call it a sprint walk, but it's an A march. And so they're just walking. I make them walk for 30 meters, um, hips up and just, you know, um, stepping over the opposite knee, toe up. Uh, as you step out, you don't try to extend your foot, but you just, you, you're basically just marching. Um, using their hands and, you know, driving their elbows back, stopping their hands at their pocket, pushing their hands up to their chin, you know, and so we do that. And then once we get to 30 meters, um, I do what we call a rotary drill. And a rotary drill is basically you start in a, um, so you start on your left side, um, knee up, hip up, just like we were marching. And then you take 20 meters and you just reverse your position. And so the next step you take, you'll have um, your right knee up, toe up. And you'll do that all the way down. Some of my athletes have advanced to where they'll, they'll bounce on their bottom foot for, you know, two steps, maybe three steps and reverse it. Um, it's a rhythm drill. And so some kids will think that we're doing an A skip. It's not an A skip. It's not a B skip. Um, it's called a rotary. Um, you know, and you have uh, plenty of, of, of schools and um, colleges, track and field, um, I would say. And um, uh, professional groups that do it and they do an extended version of it where, you know, they, they probably have them go 50 meters. And, you know, so um, I don't know if you guys are understanding what I mean by the rotary or how I'm describing it, if I'm doing a good job of describing it, um, you know, but you're, you're again, so you start off with left, left leg up, thigh parallel to the ground, toe up, knee under, toe under your knee, um, hips up. And then the next step you'll take, you'll just reverse your position and you'll go down, you know, for 20 meters, you know, and they feel, oh, coach, my hamstrings and my, my hips, uh, my glutes, you know, they'll feel it everywhere. And um, for some kids coming back from injury, I'll have them do a rotary for after they warm up and get ready to do drills. I may have them do an A march and rotary eight times, and that's their workout for the day. Um, you know, again, it's a rhythm thing. So first time some people do it, um, that and I joke that aren't good dancers, they struggle <laughs> because they they tell themselves they have no rhythm because they can't dance, which one has nothing to do with the other. If you know what you're doing, you're going to do it at the rhythm that you need to do it in. Um, you know, and it, it, it hurts and it, it builds up that you know that pelvis the way we need it to be. And um, I, I, I've been doing it for the last three years, and I wish I've done it for the 17 years prior. Awesome. Appreciate it. Any other questions from anyone else? Question. This may be, uh, this may be a reach. I don't know. I'm just thinking outside the box here. Let's talk about a little bit more the difference between like a strength issue potentially or uh, maybe not strength. Let's just say tone, pre-activity tone versus like neuromuscular timing. What do you got on that? Oh, uh, man. Uh, <laughs> I, th I think that's probably um, something that takes a lot of guessing unless you have something that could measure <laughs> one of those things. Um, I know there are like We've we've talked about we've had access to to a tensiomyography um, piece of equipment uh, where we are able to get some of that that data and some of that information on on uh, on firing um, 
different, not just the hamstrings on a bunch of different, you can look at a couple of different muscles. Um, but I, I think unless you have something to, to measure, I think you're probably just guessing. Um, but if that's the case, you could also rule out, right? You, you can do some of the other things you can strength test. And if you see that's not an issue, you can potentially rule that out. And almost by process of elimination, if it brings you back to potentially being a tone issue or, or a firing issue, um, then you can potentially explore some of those areas. Um, which if you're, if you're thinking of uh, uh, a rehab or a training program and you want it to be holistic and all encompassing, you probably should be um, addressing that at some point in your program anyway, right? We talked about the big puzzle pieces, the big rocks being you know eccentric hamstring strength, um, sprint exposure, and then the lumbo pelvic control are the big pieces, but you should also have some other things sprinkled in there as well. So if you're talking about, um, you know, timing and firing, then you probably also need to include some plyometrics in there that's going to expose the hamstrings um, to high velocities and rapid contractions um, bilaterally and, and unilaterally, unilaterally as well, especially if you identify one leg as having some kind of uh, issue. So. Beat, beat around the bush there and go in a different no, direction. But I'm glad you brought up TMG. That's a yeah. be nice to. I'm glad you brought that up. Yep. Anybody have anything else for 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 John or even outside of this a little bit? Like the big takeaways I got written down is like, you know, if I'm coaching in the weight room, I'm gonna find ways to eccentrically load the backside of my body. If I'm a performance coach or even a sport coach, I'm going to find opportunities strategically in my plan to get high speed exposure or sprinting. That's that's sometimes organic in the nature of our sport too. So that's that's good. And then going back to some of Tuck's comments and then Flurry's comments, finding ways to move efficiently and be able to provide cueing and, and feedback relative to you know coordination, especially as it revolves around lumbo lumbo control correct yep yep and then too uh along with with the sprint exposure too I, I briefly touched on it with our force velocity curve right um we definitely recommend trying to uh, like if, if you're trying to develop speed or prevent hamstring injury um trying to find ways to uh prescribe exercises that reach a variety of the force velocity conditions right because kj brought up the sled sprinting um, which is great. You go heavy or light, but then you also need to find ways to, to hit some of those top end speeds, um, whether that's once or, or a couple times a week in order to expose the hamstrings to those maximal velocities. Um, so that way, if they have to do it in training or competition, it's not a surprise, right? Because um, we know that sometimes it's highly stressful and also novel stimulus and exposures right, can have a larger impact on the body if there's not already a, a tolerance built up to, to that exposure or to that stimulus. Um, so that requires longer periods of recovery in order to adapt and build that tolerance to, to that. Um, Which is evidence that a lot of this is interconnected. So like Jake Stone a couple months ago, you know, talked about the idea of acute to chronic workload ratios of throwing in baseball, but you could do the same thing of monitoring sprint exposure and efforts and yardage um, or however you want to quantify it. But it's all interconnected on how we measure things and, and how we prepare athletes. So, well, awesome. If anybody, if no one else has anything else, man, Flurry, thank you so much. This That was excellent. Uh, we'll get that shared with everybody. And uh, just wanted to say thank you to everybody for being here. You guys that have been with us all semester, really appreciate it. Everybody that's new to, to the crowd here, thank you for coming. I hope you'll come back. We want to think about this. as This is like a coach's clinic, man. We're out doing the thing, and uh, we'll continue to make this better and better. Hopefully, we can do this in person one day. Uh, but right now, we'll stick to Zoom. And the cool thing about that is it allows us to share it after the fact. But if anybody needs anything, reach out to us and thank you guys so much. Have a great day. Thanks, Josh. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day, folks.